Hi everyone. Hope you all are doing very well. I welcome you all on the behalf of Virtual Institute for Higher Education. And today uh, I'm going to take uh, your Game Changer webinar for advanced taxation, which is being held under UK Stream. My name is Sanya Asif and I am going to discuss an advanced taxation attempt related to December on ACCA portal so that you people may come to know that how your um, advanced taxation exam has to be handled. First of all, let me just tell you that your exam is going to be of three hours and 15 minutes. And uh, before that, the instructions will be made obvious to you people. So uh, it's like, quite recommended that one has to go through all the general instructions first, but these instructions are already there on the exam portal as well. So I'm just going to show it to you in a quick manner so that you may have an idea that what sort of instructions will be available in your advanced taxation examination. So here you could see that is the first page of your exam which is laying down the general instruction in this uh, they are actually making you people familiarize with the options the buttons uh, available within the exam portal and they are specifically highlighting the fact that this exam is going to be of three hours and 15 minutes time period then as what we know when it comes to advanced taxation examination, that your question will be shown in, in the terms of exhibits. So the whole scenario related to the question is like broken down into numerous smaller sections. And uh, for every separate uh, set of information, exhibit will be provided. So that that's a kind of giving you an ease to go through the whole of the question. And it is then said that when you start doing the exam, you will have an option of like highlighting a certain thing or to strike through certain thing. If in case in the end you come to know that uh, there is a certain paragraph, a certain passage, which you don't want your examiner to mark. So you just need to cut uh, to cancel that particular passage or particular lines by striking through against it. And then the short keys, which one has to use the short indications for control and paste and keep this thing in mind that uh, these uh, short indications are like very much important when you are attempting your exam because it, it, it definitely saves much of your time. And though within this portal, you will have an option of uh, using the calculator, but cal a handy calculator option will also be given to you people. Certain particular things which will be mentioned in your exam. So I'm just going to take you to December attempt. Now I'm, I'll have to take a start with section A. As we all know that your ATX exam is basically comprising over three sections, section A, B and C, where section A is of 50 marks. Here, 40 marks are going to be tested over conceptual things, while uh, 10 marks will be rewarded to those students who will be presenting their question in a professional manner. So professional marks, uh, there are 10 professional marks which are set within the body of the question. Okay, here you go. That's how the question will appear in front of you. This is your recent exam attempt. Uh, see on the left hand side, th there are certain exhibits. So one by one, I'll open an exhibit so that you can read the whole content, the whole information, and then I'll tell you that how the question will have to be solved. And see, there are three exhibits related to this question. And here is the requirement. And it is like given to you people that how you're going to build your response. You have got two documents in order to build your response, a word processing document and a spreadsheet. If your answer has to be of narrative in nature, I mean, if it is of uh, 
theoretical type question, then you will have to choose the word processing document. If you find that your question is of like uh, a calculative in nature, then you have to use spreadsheet. And where you find that your question is basically an amalgamation of both the calculation as well as uh, the descriptive content, then you may use both documents simultaneously. I mean, for instance, if there is requirement 1A in which not just the calculation, but the description is also required. So you just need to put the answer reference number as in 1A on both word processing document as well as on spreadsheet. And you'll have to uh, give your answer on both documents simultaneously. So I'm just going to open this exhibit for you people. Uh, do let me know when you are done reading the information related to this exhibit. I'll keep on scrolling the question. Here comes the second exhibit. I've opened it for you, assuming that you have read the first exhibit. It is about the sale of 6,000 shares in Paul Limited. Now I'm going to take you the third and the last exhibit. The work that is being demanded to be carried out by you. And instead of like going through the rest of the information, uh, the requirement that I am going to show you right now um, is going to be discussed first. And this is the type of question which we expect every time to get tested in your advanced taxation examination because that's related to the ethical concerns. So here, they say that Please prepare a memorandum for the client file which addresses the following issue. And when it comes to part A, for becoming a tax advisor to Jake, I have not identified any threats to compliance with the fundamental principles of professional ethics, which would arise as a result of becoming tax advisors to Jake. Um, and explain why is it important that we contact Jake's previous tax advisor and state any other actions we should take before we agree to become Jake's advisor. This part of the question is carrying five marks. And I just hope and I actually started uh, showing you the exhibits. This part of the question, uh, you must have like gone through uh, on which I'm like continuously moving my cursor and here when it comes to the requirement it's a general requirement that you should assume that today's date is first in 2024 and respond to the instruction in the email from your manager and do not forget that we have to make the memorandum and the split of the marks allocation is shown in exhibit three for which we have just taken a start uh, the whole requirements will be of 40 marks uh, for the sake of like uh, projecting the concepts, but professional marks will be awarded for the demonstration of skills in communication, analysis in evaluation, skepticism and skepticism and the commercial acumen in your answer. And that would be of 10 marks. So we'll have to take a start with the first requirement. Here we have to make a memorandum. Okay, just suggest me one thing. Which document do I need to pick up first? What do you suggest? Should I click on the word processing document or the spreadsheet and the most important thing is that we have to focus on the verb we have to explain we have to state so which document is like going to be the most relevant one of course the word processing document fine so i am just going to open the word processing document and the whole explanation and the statement will be carrying five marks. Okay, students, so I've just enlarged the screen, uh, which could be done by just clicking on this area. If you're just going to stretch it, the size of the screen could be increased. Now you could see that there are multiple options here. You can uh, 
make bullet points you can uh, put reference numbers you can make and do an alignment you can bold your statements you can copy paste so general things which are uh, general options which are available in the word processing documents are also available here so just tell me that when i have to take a start um for preparing a memorandum one should not forget that there is a particular way of starting with such question for the files then we have to mention the name of the client which is Jake and then what has to be the next thing which I should mention while making the memorandum? What has to be the third thing? A very general question. Yes, we need to mention the heading memorandum. Yes, the subject, the best thing. One should not forget that we need to mention the subject, the most important thing. Subject, new, unincorporated business and related matters, right? And then who is like going to prepare it? The tax senior. And of course, the date, which is First of January 2024. So these are the relevant things which one has to mention uh, for showing the exact way of presenting a memorandum. And now we'll have to discuss the relevant points related to what has been asked. Now when to become a tax advisor to Jake they want us to make an explanation uh, regarding the reasons for contacting Jake's previous advisors. Uh, see, this is like very important because uh, one has to contact Jake's previous advisor to discover any matters which may influence uh, our decisions to uh, continue with the work. For instance, if Jake's attitude to disclosure of the information to uh, His Majesty Remnant Customs and the reasons Jake has decided to ch uh, change his tax advisor. So we really need to know that what has actually led him to take us on board? What has happened with the previous advisors? We really want to see that whether Jake is in a situation to misguide something. In, does he want to do any misrepresentation? And that could only be confirmed if he gives us a permission to contact his previous advisors. And um, we really need to obtain the information which is essential to ensure that Jake's affairs are transferred without any sort of uh, errors. For instance, details of any elections, the claims that he has previously made. So if we find that Jake is like uh, uh, is trying to prevent us from discussing his affairs from uh, previous advisors, the ACCA's Code of Ethics and Conduct state that this is a red flag. I mean, we should not accept him as our client plus what is the other action which we need to take a very general thing and i would like you people to have an input in this thing 
as what they are saying that what are the other matters what are the action other actions we should take before we would like to become jake's tax advisor what is your take on it uh check his attitude to law and we would like to check that if something has happened in the past under which he could have caught uh, uh, under money laundry regulations and a very general thing which we really need to obtain from him before becoming his tax advisor. One should not forget that we need to obtain his evidence, uh, I mean, his identity, his address. These are the basic things which we need to uh, take up first and then the rest of the things are to be addressed, right? So I'm just going to type it down in order to show you that how uh, the answer has to be mentioned. So that's our document. So I'm just going to mention the reference number. Do not forget to mention the requirement number because that's how your examiner uh, will find an ease to um, give you marks. And I'm going to put a heading as well becoming Jake's tax advisor. So contacting Jake's Previous advisor, it's like to obtain evidences which might influence our decision to take up Jake's work and see the whole question is of five marks so one should be like making five relevant points and that's enough that these are sufficient to score maximum marks are transferred to Jake's affairs are transferred to HMRC in the past without having any element of administrative error and if Jake prevent us to contact his previous advisor then ACCA code of ethics state that we should not accept him as a client. And as the second thing that which they wanted to know is the other things to be taken into account or other actions to take. It's like We should take Jake's evidence to get his identity or address. And the second thing is we should carry out 
the procedures. to assure ourselves that Jake is not involved in any sort of money laundering activities. Now, as they actually asked us two things, so I'm just going to highlight them. I have just going to bold it. So that examiner quickly come to know that where the answer has been mentioned and in precisely what manner we have given the answer. So see, this is how uh, we started off with the memorandum. We have actually uh started with the desired style of memorandum and then the first requirement has been typed down and um, here i have mentioned all the necessary things which have been asked now is there anything else which you need to ask regarding this part of the question and students it's confirmed that five marks will definitely be tested on ethics so one should not do this mistake of not going through this uh, chapter of ethics at any cost you really need to prepare yourself for this chapter because five marks are must out of this chapter there was a question should we align it's better when we are uh, like doing our um, professional task when we are carrying out a professional task as what being done in this question uh, here we are making a memorandum which is being prepared by the tax senior. So the work has to be presented in a professional manner. And yes, then alignment becomes one of the necessary things. Anything else which you need to know, do let me know. Students, if it's fine, then I'm going to read the second requirement of the question. How much time for each mark should be planned? Technically, one should plan to uh, score each mark in 1.8 minutes specifically because though your paper is off, your exam is off 3 hours and 15 minutes, which means that in total you have nine, 195 minutes and... Um, That would mean one should be like uh, spending 1.95 minutes to score each mark. But I would suggest that you will be spending 1.8 minutes to uh, score a mark because you will have to gather few minutes for the sake of like understanding and reading the questions as well. So technically one should take a uh, some time out in the first in order to read the question first in order to understand the requirements of the question first and afterwards he will have to jot down the answer and for that purpose 1.8 minutes per mark is like going to be sufficient so it has to be met within 1.8 minutes clear though 20 marks are for professional but for instance if i being a student i start uh, presenting my answer I, not being a professional one, if I am a student, I will take time in order to make alignment, in order to uh, present my answer in the most appropriate manner. So uh, one should always try to score one mark in 1.8 minutes. But, but on the other hand, those 40 marks which are of conceptual in nature, they are lengthy enough. So if you just make your mind according to 1.8 minutes, uh, then somehow in between 1.8 to 1.85, you get yourself settled down somewhere and uh, would then be able to uh, complete your exam. And completing the exam is like one of the most important things. I mean, time management 
does make a good impression on your examiner. Right? So here now you can see the second requirement of the question, requirement P. And let me just tell you that the requirement B is a lengthy one because it is going to have three sub requirements. Requirement B1, it is about insurance proceeds available for investment in the business. Then there comes B2, which is about tax deductions in respect of expenditure to be incurred. The first requirement B1 is of eight marks. The second requirement B2 is of eight marks while there is another requirement B3 where we have to take alternative plan for the use of the York building and this part of the question is carrying six marks. So eight plus eight plus six. That's how you can imagine that this particular requirement of the question will be carrying 20 two marks in total. So that's like quite a lot. So I'm going to take a start with the first requirement. Here they say about new unincorporated business and they have highlighted that exhibit one is related to this thing. That when carrying out task one and two below, you should ignore the alternative plan for the use of the York building and simply assume that the whole of the York building will be used for the purpose of carrying on Jake's unincorporated business and you should also ignore that. So the first requirement is that insurance proceeds which are available for investment purposes in the business on the assumption that the construction of the York building will be completed and paid for on 1st February 2024 and explain the reliefs available to Jake in respect of the chargeable gain resulting uh, from the destruction of the wall building. See, so within requirement B1, there is a first requirement and there is a second requirement as well that on the assumption that Jake claims to uh, claims the relief you have identified in one and will have total income in the tax year 23, 24 of 30,000 pound. Here we have to calculate the amount of post-tax insurance proceeds which will be available after the construction of the York building for investment in the new business. And this part of the question is carrying eight marks. So let's start with requirement B1. Okay, so within the first requirement, where we have to explain the relief available to Jake in respect of the chargeable gain resulting from the destruction of the building. Now, again, suggest me that which document is going to be most relevant. Should I consider the Word document or the spreadsheet? Again, it is like all about explanation. So yes, the word processing document is the most relevant one. I will not forget to put the answer reference number as well as the heading so that examiner may find an ease to check my working properly. So here what I have to mention, so sorry. Requirement B. Which is about new unincorporated business in general. And within the first requirement, here we have to discuss insurance proceeds available for investment in the business. There's a suggestion that why not we copy paste from the question and you are absolutely right. First, I just wanted to uh, show you that how the typing uh, speed could be made better. But in the second step, I had to tell you that these things which are like quite obvious within the uh, text could have been like easily copied from questions side to the answer side. So... Okay, from the next requirement on, we'll be using this tactic. And this is like the best approach in order to save your time. So this is like about the relief available in respect of the gain on the wall building. So let's try.
So the relief available in respect of the chargeable gain resulting from the destruction of the wall building, I am using the short keys control C and I'm just going to use the word processing document. Control V is the pasting thing. So within requirement B1, the first requirement is about this relief. And um, okay, so here we have to write down the relief which is available. As we all know that uh, the wall building has been sold and there appears to be a gain in respect of its disposal. But um, the gain which is like relevant to the wall building, it's not because it is being sold. It is actually destroyed. And uh, as a result of its destruction, which is like considered to be one of the important constituent for the sake of considering it as a chargeable disposal activity, which is why whatsoever the insurance proceeds have been received against this uh, destruction if they are going to be used for the sake of acquiring a replacement asset then a rollover relief will be available provided the proceeds that we are receiving are going to be reinvested within a time period of 12 months after getting the receipt from insurance proceed and that's how the gain is like going to be uh, rolled over and whatsoever the amount of gain is going to get rolled over that is going to get deducted against the cost of the new asset in order to determine the base cost and that's how the gain will be deferred until the next time the new asset is going to be sold and keep also one thing in mind that if all the proceeds which are received from the uh, destruction of this asset are not going to get reinvested then the amount which is not spent which is not reinvested uh, the gain equivalent to that amount shall become immediately chargeable. So I'm just going to write them down over here. So this is basically the answer uh, related to part B1 of the question. If there is anything else which you find not appropriate, please do let me know by dropping your concern in the dialogue box. And afterwards, we'll start with requirement b1 sub requirement 2 which is of calculative in nature so these were those points which i had discussed but i have typed them down in order to show you that how the presentation of the question will have to be made so see i have further made bullet points in order to make the whole presentation attractive uh, the whole presentation in a much professional manner so that examiner will not just be giving me as a student the conceptual marks but also uh, will be awarding me with the professional marks. Shall I proceed? Okay. So, now, the second requirement is that on the assumption that J claims the relief you have identified in one above and will have the total income in the tax year of 23-24 of 30,000 pound. Here we have to calculate the amount of post-tax insurance proceeds which will be available after the construction of York building for investment in the new business. And this part of the question is carrying uh, eight marks. So technically they are asking about the insurance proceeds which are available for investment in the business. So again, this is like related to the second requirement. It is about insurance amount available for investment 
in a business because Jake is going to use some of the proceeds for reinvestment into the new asset. And of course, the asset which is destroyed and insurance proceeds are received and considering the whole amount is not going to get reinvested on that amount the tax liability shall have to be paid so right after purchasing a new asset as well as paying off the taxes whatsoever the figure is left that is like an extra income which jake has and he will be able to make use of this extra proceeds for uh the sake of investment into the business right so First of all, what I have to do is I just need to see that how much insurance proceed has been received and uh, I just need to know that uh, what is the cost of the new building which is being used, which is being purchased by Jake for reinvestment purposes. I'm just going to open the exhibit one. Though this question has been read by you people uh, thoroughly and uh, in a proper way, but still uh, you will have to keep on consulting with the question. So they say that insurance proceeds of £380,000 were received and that resulted into a gain of £130,000. And this is the only chargeable gain related to 2324. And it is like that he has decided to use some of the insurance proceeds to have a new building, the York building constructed on the site where the wall building was situated. And the construction of the York building will cost £335,000. Though um, they've also said that uh, on this building that VAT liability, the sales tax figure has also been paid uh, in addition to the price of 20%. But if you remember that when we were like going through the requirement B of this question, they have explicitly explicitly said that one will not be making use of, well, one will not be like paying attention towards the VAT implication related to this building. So just ignoring the fact that VAT is being charged on the purchase price of the building, let's see that what is going to happen in respect of the disposal of the old building and see here the calculation is required so it's better if i will be using the spreadsheet though for instance if i mishandle the sheets i mean if any calculation is being done on word processing document instead of spreadsheet as long as the calculation is being done appropriately examiner will definitely give me marks but when it comes to calculations it's always advisable to use spreadsheet because uh, the cells within the spreadsheet are like giving you an option to do the calculation instantly and this is how you can be able to save your time see so I have opened the spreadsheet so first of all I am going to calculate tax liability related to the gain not deferred and the gain which is not deferred is basically the gain um, which appeared because of not making the whole uh, reinvestment. So how much of the insurance proceeds were received, which are to be taken as disposal proceeds? That was of 380,000 pound. They did not tell us that uh, what was the cost of the wall building, but they have told us the very important thing that what is the gain related to the disposal of this building, I mean, the destruction of this building, and that was of 130,000 pounds. But the problem is that 
some of the gain is like going to be rolled over because the reinvestment into another asset is going to take place within uh, 12 months. So I need to see that what is the amount which is being used for the sake of like getting another building. The new building is being purchased for 335,000 pounds, right? So... Three hundred and thirty-five thousand is going to be the cost of the new building, and um, how much proceeds we received against the disposal of the old building that was of three hundred and eighty thousand pound, which shows that how much figure has not been reinvested. This would be of forty-five thousand pound. So forty-five thousand pound is the amount of gain that has not been reinvested. So this much amount of the gain is going to be immediately chargeable. And see, they said that this is the only disposal made by Jake in the year. So if this is the only current year gain and there is like no uh, current year loss or the brought forward loss. So I'm just going to quickly compute my CGT liability. But don't forget that we have to still adjust the annual exemption amount, which is of 12,300 pounds. And after deducting the annual exempt amount, I'll be able to come to know what uh, the taxable gain figure is. So what's going to be the taxable gain figure? This is of 32,700 pounds. So this is the taxable gain, which would mean that CGT liability shall have to be paid on this gain. Now, I want to ask you people that what trade do I need to apply on the gain? The gain is of 32,700 pounds. And let me just show you the most important thing related to this point. I'm just going to highlight it that Jake has got a total income in the tax year of 23, 24 of 30,000 pounds. So with the help of this thing, would you be able to assess that uh, what kind of rate do we have to apply on the gain, which is like related to the disposal of wall building? There's an answer that 7700 is going to get adjusted uh, at the rate of 10%. Just tell me. As they have highlighted the 30,000 pound is Jake's total income. This would definitely help me out in determining that how much of the basic rate band has been used for the sake of calculating his income tax liability and whatsoever the basic rate band is left that will be used for the sake of calculating CGT liability. Do you agree with this thing? Do you remember that this is the thing which is like connected? Okay. So, £30,000 is not the taxable income. If you uh, just remember that when we have to calculate our income tax liability, first of all, we need to segregate our income in order to get the total income. And they have given us the total income of 30000 Then we have to deduct the qualifying interest payment, which is not given in the question. Yes, you are right. Then we have to deduct the personal allowance figure, which is of £12,570 in order to see what the taxable income is. Because taxable income tends to use the basic rate band first. And afterwards, the capital gains tax liability shall have to be used, shall have to be calculated on the basis of this thing. So, I am just going to see this thing that how much of the basic rate band is available. It is like if 30,000 pound is the Tax is the total income against which the personal allowance figure of 12,570 will have to be adjusted. That would show us that how much of the basic rate band is available. That's of 17,430, right? So 17,430 was the taxable income. Do not forget that this 17,430 is the taxable income. So I'm just going to write it over here. 17,430 
was the taxable income for income tax purposes. And now I am going to see that how much of the basic rate band is available. See, I've changed the position. As the basic rate band does have 37,700 pound normally, out of which uh, the taxable income of 17,430 pound has already made use of um, the basic rate band first, which shows that there is still a margin of 20,270 to be left in the basic rate band, right? So 20,270 is being left in the basic rate band. And now I'm going to calculate CGT liability. And on 20,270, the basic rate shall have to be applied, which is of 10%. So it's going to be of 20,270 into 10%, while the remaining gain shall have to be adjusted in the high rate band. As the total taxable gain is of 32,700, against which the amount that has already been taxed under the basic rate band, it is of 20,270. So the leftover gain shall be charged over a high rate of 20%. And see, it's a commercial building. Had it been a residential building, then instead of applying the rates of 10 and 20%, I should have straight away applied the rate of 18 and 28%. So see, it's 32,700 less 20,270. The leftover figure shall be charged at the rate of 20%. So that's how the tax figure is going to be of 2486. And this is how... I will tell you that what is going to be my overall CGT liability. This would be of 4,513 pounds. So this is like said to be uh, the CGT liability. Okay. So as Jake is receiving 380,000 pounds from insurance company and will be investing 335,000 pounds into the new company, which is why some of the gain is uh, left uninvested on which tax liability is going to be due, I need to see this thing that right after paying off the taxes, how much income is left with Jake? Because on the leftover income, he will have a margin to make an investment into the business. And that was basically asked in the question. Let me just show you that what was asked, that calculate the amount of post-tax insurance proceeds which will be used, which will be available uh, after the construction of York building, the investment in the new business, right? I'm just going to copy this statement. And uh, now I am going to show it over here. So, how much amount did Jake receive? 380,000 pound. How much amount, how much figure is like going to be spent for the sake of construction of new building, for the sake of like purchasing or construction of new building? It's of 335,000 pound. And how much of the tax is going to be paid off? It is of 4,513 pound. And that's how we'll be able to come to know that how much amount is like still available for the sake of making an investment into the business. So it is of, Four zero four eight seven. So this much figure is available for investment. Okay. So is there anything else which you need to know, which is bothering you, which has not been completely understood? Please let me know by dropping your concern in the dialog box. Uh, the main purpose of Today's session is not just to tell you that how the answer has to be presented in your exam, but also to revise all the concepts. Which had been tested in your December 2023 examination, because all the examinations of advanced taxation are somehow like uh, tested on the same pattern. So if you come to know that how the things are to be tempted for December, you will surely uh, become able to prepare yourself for March 24 examination in a better way. There's a question, should we separately show each calculation formula? 
in spreadsheet yes if your calculation is like lengthy enough then you have to break it down so that your examiner will become able to know that how the steps have been performed because if there are few steps will be carrying which will be carrying 0.5 marks the rest of the steps will be carrying 0.25 marks while there are few, uh, some steps which might be carrying 1 to 1.5 marks but if the calculation is like very little enough, then the whole calculation can be done in a single cell as well. But where you find that the calculation is like a bit lengthy, then try to break it down into numerous smaller steps. Right? Okay. So let's move towards requirement B2 of the question. And within the requirement B2, there are four separate points for which you need, really need to take care of. And this uh, requirement of the question is also carrying eight marks. Here, we need to discuss about the tax deductions in respect of the expenditure to be incurred. Explain when, if at all, Jake will be available, uh, will be able to obtain a tax deduction for the cost he is likely to have incurred in respect of visiting. Uh, potential customers and we also have to make an explanation the tax deductions which will be available in Jake's first trading period ending on 30th April 2025 in respect of the cost of the construction of the York building and the purchase of the car. So here we have to make two explanations so you are wise enough to decide that which document is going to be more appropriate it is of Word processing document again. Requirement B2. So, in answering this requirement B2, here we have to discuss the tax deductions in respect of the expenditures to be incurred. So I'm just co copy this line from the body within the question and I'm going to paste it over here. And then. Okay, so students do let me know what is your thought about visiting potential customers? Does any uh, sort of tax deduction available? Uh, in respect of making visit visits to the potential customers. And let me clarify one thing. By visiting uh, potential customers would not mean that we are providing them with the entertainment. We are trying to develop uh, the business contacts because customers and suppliers are the most important people. Though we all know that when it comes to uh, entertaining customers and suppliers. This is like said to be a disallowed expenditure. But they are talking about making visits to potential customers. Do you think is it allowable? And considering it is being incurred prior to the start of commercial activity, prior to the start of the trade. So what do you suggest? It is deductible or not deductible? Technically, they are telling us about the traveling expenses and they have like given it a very confusing term because when students would look at the word of customers or suppliers, they instantly think as if it is about uh, like something which is disallowed. But technically, this is not the entertainment expenditure. Rather, they want to say that this is like the traveling expense. Yes, you are right. This is the deductible expense. So, as they're intending to start their business on 1st May 2024, uh, keep one thing in mind that I have to make an explanation. So, if I just write deductible, so this is not a multiple choice question. Examiner is not going to give me a credit because this is not the professional way of uh, writing it down. Though I actually asked you to tell me whether it's deductible or not, but I really hope that you are quite intelligent students and when such 
questions are uh, given to you people in your real exam, you will be making like appropriate statements. So um, we would write that traveling expenses are deductible from trading profit as they have been incurred wholly and exclusively for the purpose of trade. Secondly, any expense which is incurred within seven years prior to the start of trade which is 1st May 24 in this case is deductible against trading profit Considering as if the expense has been incurred on the very first day of the start of the business. But the expense is only deductible. If it is allowed under taxation rules as in enter taining customers is never allowed right so you have said that this is the traveling expense and this is not basically the entertainment expense. Though you could quote any example, any other example, but to tell them that if the expense has been incurred within time period of seven years prior to the start of trade and it's like allowable uh, in general as well. I mean, if the trade would have been started, even then uh, HMRC would have allowed you to make a deduction, then such expenses are deductible. And... Uh, the traveling expenses are treated as if they are incurred on the first day of trading that is 1st May 2024 right did you get this point I should put the heading as well visiting potential clients And then there's a question. Can you remind if there are any similar seven-year rules for expenses? It is applicable on every type of expense, whether it is like related to uh, any uh, traveling expense, any advertisement expense, any uh, employee cost. If it is incurred in seven years prior to the start of the trade, it is of revenue in nature then the expense is deductible. But those expenses which are generally not allowed by uh, HMRC, whether they would incur 
after the start of trade or they are going to incur before the start of trade, they will never be considered as allowed uh, allowable deductions. Now there is like another thing which they have asked and that's about the construction of the York building. See, keep on looking at the requirements again and again because a human mind cannot retain that uh, how many requirements have been asked. So here we have to make an explanation of the tax deductions which will be available in Jake's first trading period ending on 30th April 2025 in respect of the cost of the construction of the York building and then the purchase of the car. So I am now going to discuss the tax implication, the tax deduction rule related to the construction of the York building. And please confirm me, is my voice clear to you all? Is there any sort of destruction or whatever you are having right now? So again, the explanation is necessary, which is why I'm going to use the same word processing document. And here I am going to put this heading. And now I will have to tell that what sort of tax deduction is available. And for that purpose, I'm going to open the exhibit once, uh, exhibit one once again. And they say that the building is going to cost the York building is going to cost 335,000 pounds plus 20% VAT. But do you remember that uh, in the start of this requirement, it was said that ignore the VAT implication and the cost of 335,000 pounds includes 75,000 pounds in respect of electrical system, heating system and other integral features. And uh, I plan to use the whole of the York building for the purpose of carrying on my unincorporated business from 1st of May 2024. So though 335,000 pound is being spent for the purchase of building, uh, 75,000 is like somehow separate. Yes, you are right. This is like a system on which capital allowances are going to be claimed. So yes, capital allowances are going to be claimed on the systems and these are all the integral features of building, right? So uh, the cost of integral features would qualify for tax deduction in terms of capital allowances. And here, as if what I've said, that all these expenses are treated as if they are being incurred on the very first day of trading, which would mean that if the first period is like going to be considered as the period of purchase for such items. So here, instead of like claiming um, uh, WDA at the rate of 6%, we would be able to claim annual investment allowance. But keep one thing in mind, if these items were secondhand items, then unfortunately no annual investment allowance will have been available in such cases. But this point is like rarely tested. And see, these are not the secondhand items as these things are being constructed, prepared for the very first time, right? And what's the cost of the building is going to be figured out. Uh, I mean, out of 335,000, if 75,000 pound is related to the systems, to plant and machinery, the leftover cost uh, is the cost related to the structures and the buildings, which is why they will qualify for structures and building allowance. Uh, but on that cost, one will be able to claim an allowance at the rate of 3%. So we just need to write down all these points. Integral features of building will qualify for capital allowances considering the expense of 75,000 pound is being treated in its first period, it shall qualify for 
annual investment allowance so the whole amount of annual investment allowance i mean the whole amount of 75000 pound is deductible against trading profits in the first accounting period, right? And then the remaining cost related to York building which is of 335,000 less 75,000 pound. Here you'll have to make use of calculator or you can also uh, use the calculator which is given in the portal though it is not always easy to use that calculator but still I would like to show you I'm just going to cross it first this is the first hurdle which I have to face and then see I have got a calculator option over here so it's like if 335,000 pound is the cost out of it 75,000 is related to the system so 260,000 pound is the cost related to the building so see uh, it acts it is though you, uh, a functional type of calculator but if you have to use that calculator you will have to uh, do the other formalities as well you'll have to like close the other tabs and then you'll have to uh, reach to the calculator so if a calculator a simple one obviously that could be taken to examination center if it is like a handy calculator with you you can make use of that calculator instantly so 260,000 pound being the cost of the building. Will qualify for structures and building allowance at the rate of 3%. So, could you please tell me 260,000 into 3% would constitute what? 3% of 260,000 pound. What would it actually equate to? This will be equivalent to 7,800 pounds. So, I've done it on my, I've done the calculation on my calculator. So, 260,000 into 3%, that would be equivalent to 7,800 pound will be deductible from the first accounting period ending as uh, the trade is going to start on 1st May 2024. So first accounting period would come to an end on 30th of April 2020. Right. So this is like going to be uh, the first period against which SPA will be deductible. But I hope you remember that SPA is deductible for a very long period of time as by applying 3% over the cost of the building, it is possible to keep on uh, claiming an allowance for 33 years and 4 months with respect to the cost of the building. Right. Is that clear? So just to beautify the whole thing, I have uh, put the all the statements in the form of bullets. Students, is that all okay? Or there is something which is bothering you which has not yet been clearly understood? There's a question. So for SPA, we can annually deduct 3% for building. Yes, we have an option to keep on deducting 3% over 
over the cost of the buildings on annual basis and uh, this would mean that in total we would have 33 years and four months uh, for the sake of like making the full deduction regarding uh, the cost of the building right so this another thing which was embedded along with the third requirement uh, along with the second requirement uh, and it was about the purchase of the car. So I am now going to discuss the matters related to the purchase of the car. Again, as the tax deduction implication has to be made, so word processing document is the best document right now. I am so sorry. Okay. The purchase of the car. And for that purpose, again, I'm going to take you through the question. They say, That on 1st May 24, I will purchase a new car, which I will use 65% for business purposes and 35% for private purposes. This will not be a car with zero carbon dioxide emission. Right? So, they haven't clearly mentioned that what is the carbon dioxide emission of the car. Had it been an electric car, a new electric car with zero carbon dioxide emission, then the situation would have been like pretty much simple. We could have been able to apply first year allowance at the rate of 100%. But there they simply say that this is not a car with zero carbon dioxide emission. So we do not know. We are indecisive as in if the car is like having a carbon dioxide emission of up to 50 grams per kilometer, their WDA at the rate of 18% shall apply. Or if the car's carbon dioxide emission is found to be of greater than 50 grams per kilometer, then WDA at the rate of 6% shall apply, right? You are right. But you will have to mention one more thing as they have specifically said that uh, this is an unincorporated business, right? This is not the company. So when a self-employed person is like making accounts and he's making a personal use of anything, then only the business proportion of the expense is deductible. The private proportion of the expense is disallowed. So we just need to mention these two things. So what would I have to write regarding the purchase of the car that... WDA either at the rate of 18% if carbon dioxide emission is not more than 50 gram per kilometer is charged or at the rate of 6% where carbon dioxide emission is found to be greater than 50 grams per kilometer. Have you noticed one thing that whenever I am using the values, I am not bothering that whether uh, I have to apply the symbol or not. See, if you tend to get time, you may apply the sign, the symbol of pound. But uh, if in case you do not find the time, then that's perfectly fine. The examiner would say that I am interested in like uh, judging your knowledge. I just, I do know that when the figure is quoted, it is understood that it is carrying a sign of pound in it. So if you don't apply the sign, then even then it's perfectly fine. Or the best possible approach is that when you are going to end certain question, then you will be like putting a sign of pound at the end or maybe uh, in, in its very uh, first step. So... If you are using a sign of pound somewhere either at the end or in the start 
or if you are not using the sign at all that that is not going to have an impact on your marks earning capacity so it's like we have said that wda is going to be charged either at the rate of 18% or 6% but only 65% of the capital allowance is deductible because we are talking about the deductible expense against trading profits because this is the car with personal use of J, right? So that's how we have covered requirement B2 of the question as well. So could you see that how I have mentioned the points even if I would like to bring more clarity to the presentation style of this question, I will just have to convert it into the bullet points. Is that okay? There is a question. We should, okay. Can you talk about allowances of secondhand asset, please? So see, for instance, there is like um, actually a thin line difference. For instance, if I'm a self-employed person and I'm going to purchase an asset, whether it's a first-hand asset or a second-hand asset, in both cases, it does qualify for annual investment allowance, right? But if I purchase an asset which I use for personal purposes first, and if I keep on using the asset on personal scale and then I bring the asset for business use, despite the fact in the business, this asset is going to be used for the very first time. But considering this asset had been kept using by the same person for the personal scale, it is not just a secondhand asset, but considering the person who is like bringing the asset for the use in business was the same person who had been using the asset on personal scale, their annual investment allowance is not going to be claimed right? There's a question for each point. Can we write para instead? Yes, you can make paragraph. But see, while making a paragraph, you will have to put a lot of English. You'll have to make a lot of statements. You will have to refine it a lot. But if you make the bullet points, and let me just tell you, the examiner uh, would like this bullet style as well. So you will be like uh, making a good presentation style in which not just you are making appropriate, complete sentences, but they are going to be made in a concise way. So that's how you can be able to save your time on one hand. And on the second hand, you will be like telling each and everything to the examiner. But if in case you are more comfortable doing the whole thing in the form of para, then it is like up to you. That is perfectly fine. Right? Shall I move to the third requirement of the question? Okay, so part B3. This part of the question is carrying six marks. Okay, before that, I start with part B3. The, uh, again, I'm going to answer the question about AIA. C. if I am a self-employed person, I'm doing my business and I'm going to purchase an asset and going to bring the asset for the first time use in my business, whether the asset is like brand new or it is a used one by someone else. So if an asset is either a first-hand asset or a second-hand asset, but I'm going to bring the asset for the very first time and that is being taken to the business instantly by me, here I can claim AIA. So AIA is claimable on both first-hand assets as well as second-hand assets. But where I being a self-employed person, I would purchase an asset 
for my personal use first and after using the asset for few months or years then i'll be bringing the asset to my business so despite the fact the asset is being used in the business for the very first time the but the asset had been kept on a personal scale but the asset has been used on a personal scale by me first before bringing the asset for business use and in such cases when the asset is when the asset is not just the second hand asset considering the same asset has been used by the same person who is running the business right now had been using it on personal scale there the opportunity to claim annual investment allowance is lost right so if an asset is first brought for personal use and then it is brought to business uh, aia cannot be claimed otherwise in rest of the situations it is claimed whether it's about first hand asset or second hand asset Okay, so quickly move towards part B3 of this question. Here we need to devise an alternative plan for the use of the York building. When carrying out this task 3, you should assume that alternative plan for the use of York building is allowed. And um, I can confirm that the supplies to be made by Jake's unincorporated business will be wholly standardated for VAT purposes. However, due to the application of the capital goods scheme, Jake's ability to recover the full 67,000 pound of input tax over the life of the building will be restricted unless he opts to tax the building. So what the requirement is, here we have to calculate the maximum amount of additional input VAT which Jake could recover if he were to elect to opt to tax the York building on 1st May 2024 and your calculations should indicate the years in which the input tax would be recovered. So here we have to calculate the best possible uh, document is the spreadsheet, which I'm going to use right now. And uh, I am going to copy the heading. The requirement number right so just to clarify to the examiner that which requirement is now being answered i have to mention uh the requirement number along with the explanation okay so let me just open the question again this is the alternative plan written over here that i'm considering an alternative plan for the use of the york building as follows for a period of four years from May 24, I would use 70% of the York building for the purposes of carrying on my unincorporated business and I would rent out the remainder of the building from that date. By the end of the four-year period, my business should have grown sufficiently to require the use of the whole building. Right? So here, now the issue is We need to figure out the maximum amount of additional input VAT which Jake could recover if he were to elect to opt to tax the York building. So here we'll have to make a comparison that if no option to tax will be existing, then how much of the VAT is uh, recoverable? And if option to tax is going to be elected, then how much amount of VAT is recoverable and that's how we'll be able to come to know how much VAT is like additionally recoverable. So first of all, I am going to show you that if there is like no option to tax existing, then what is going to happen? If you further highlight your answers, you can make use of the colors. You can highlight it, fill the cell, so this is like up to you that how you are going to uh, present your answer. But please don't indulge yourself in unnecessary coloring and beautification because in the end, your concepts will actually be attracting the examiner to score marks, right? But still, some element of the presentation has to be there. It has to be neat. It has to be clear. It has to be complete. And uh, the use of uh, bold lines uh, the underlined statements, that is like pretty enough to be used in your exam. So,
what happens in year one if no option to tax will be existing? As they have told you that what is the amount of total input tax? It is of 67,000 pound. Let me show it to you again. 67,000 pound uh, is the total input fat. This is shown within the body of the requirement of the question. And when it comes to uh, the main question, it is said that he would use 70% of the York building for the sake of carrying on my business activities. While the left, the remaining portion, I mean 30% of the building will be rented out. And by the end of the four year period, my business should have grown sufficiently to require the use of the whole building. So after four years, he'll be making 100% of the building to be used in his business, right? So. What is like going to happen in year one as the building is going to be acquired on 1st May 24 and the first year would come to an end on 30th April 25. So I'm going to mention the year. Year one is the year ended 30th of April 2025. So 67,000 pound is the total cost of building and as of now only 70% of the building is being used for uh, business activities while 30% of the building is being rented out is being used for non-business activities so only 70% of the bat is recoverable so it's like 67,000 pound into 70% that would make 646,900 to be recoverable and then they say that this is going to be, uh, this is going, the, the, the same issue is like going to sustain for the next four years. I mean, for the year one, as well as for the next four years. So it's like for the first five years, uh, I mean, sorry, for the first four years, including the year one, the situation remains the same where 70% of the building will have been used for business purposes, while rest of the 30% will be used for non-business purposes. But when it comes to year five, I mean, after four years, including the first year, from year five till year 10, the business use of the building will be changed. Where 100% of the building would start being used for business purposes. So this would mean that for the year five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 30% of the VAT, which has not get uh, which has not been recovered initially will now become recoverable but not for the first four years but for the remaining six years from year five to year 10. So it's like as the total amount of VAT is of 67,000 pound and when we are adjusting this amount we have to take an adjustment period of 10 years in case of land and building. And here, how much of the VAT is going to be recovered extra? This would be of 30%. And uh, this amount is recoverable from year 5 to year 10. I mean, for next 6 years. So, how much of the VAT is like recoverable from year 5? to year 10 that's of 12,000 and 60 pounds so in total in total the amount of VAT which is recoverable in this case will be of 46,900 as well as 12,060 so that's of 58,960 pound and in simple terms as the adjustment period in case of uh, land and buildings which are caught under capital goods scheme is of 10 years where in the first four years 70 percent of the building was being used for business purposes so initially 70 percent of the VAT is recoverable but considering from year five till year 10 the business was being used completely for business purposes so the remaining 30 percent for the next of the six years will become recoverable as well so the total input VAT in this case is of 58,960 pounds and here 
this is the amount of VAT uh, which is recoverable where no option to tax would be existing. But if in case we elect to opt for the tax as by opt to tax would mean that uh, the whole building is like being used for business purposes completely. So here the whole amount of VAT is recoverable. So 100% of the input VAT being paid is recoverable. So in this case, 67,000 pound is recoverable, right? So where option to tax is existing, the whole amount of VAT is recoverable. But then uh, whatsoever the rental we will be earning uh, from this building, they will be considered as taxable supply on which output VAT is going to be due as well. So now you could see that the amount of total VAT which is recoverable where there is no option to tax is existing and where the option to tax is existing is there in front of you. And here I can figure out that how much additional input VAT is recoverable if one would opt to, uh, if one would elect to opt to tax the building. Additional input VAT recoverable. This would be of 67,000 pound less 58,960 pound. So this is how 8,040 pound. That's the answer. This is the additional amount of input VAT, which is recoverable if Jake would elect to opt to tax the building. Is that clear? This was about requirement B3 of this question. Did you get this point? Uh, they wanted to say that in case of building, we have an option whether to make an election to opt to tax or not. So if there is no option to tax would be existing, the less amount of VAT is recoverable. But where option to tax the whole building is possible, the whole amount of VAT is recoverable. And here we need to make a comparison that how much extra VAT is going to be recoverable if we make an election regarding to opt the building. Though when we opt the building, there's a disadvantage as well because whatsoever the taxable supplies we are going to generate against this building as in uh, the rentals which, are, which we are going to uh, receive as a result of letting the building out will become taxable supplies on which output VAT will have to be due. But the advantage would be that the whole amount of VAT is recoverable. So we need to compare that if on one hand we'll be recovering the whole amount of VAT and on the other hand we'll be, we will not be recovering the whole amount of VAT, then how much extra advantage in respect of input VAT uh, will be what if there would be an option to tax existing in the scenario. Right. So now we have covered part B1, B2 and B3. And here I am going to take you part C, the last part of this question, which is like quite lengthy enough because this is carrying 13 marks. So it is about the sale of shares in POL Limited, Pole Limited, for which Exhibit 2 is to be considered so that is the best part of these questions because they've like divided the whole question into exhibit so you need not to go through the exhibit one once again they have given you the hint as well so here on the assumption that jake sells the poll limited shares in the tax year 24 25 for four hundred and seventy thousand pound and that his aunt dies between now first january 24 and 31st december 26 that is within seven years of potentially exempt transfer here you have to consider three things. We have to explain without carrying out any collection uh, calculations. Jake's potential liability to inheritance tax at the time of the sale of the shares and on the subsequent death of his aunt. And then we have to calculate the chargeable gain arising from the sale before the deduction of any available reliefs and explain whether or not the following reliefs would be available. And here we have to consider the business asset disposal relief, I mean BADR as well as rollover relief. And we have to explain the reliefs which would be available in respect of any IHT due. So students, 
see in answering this part of the question we will have to break down the requirement into three sub requirements where the first sub requirement will be demanding for an explanation so i'll be using the word processing document the second requir sub requirement of part c will be requiring a cal calculation so i'll be using a spreadsheet and then again the explanation will have to be made for which word processing document is important but again see if in case in your exam you will not be using the appropriate document for whatever reason maybe you forget you uh, couldn't become able to judge it appropriately and as a result of this you start doing your working on a document which might not be like suitable according to the requirement then it's perfectly fine your examiner will not be cutting your marks on the basis of this thing that which document you have chosen up though when you are doing the question things become easier if descriptive questions are to be done on word processing documents and calculations are being presented on spreadsheet that that is for the sake of your ease right so here i have to make an explanation without doing any calculation the jake's potential liability to inheritance tax at the time of the sale of the shares and on the subsequent death of his aunt so i'm just going to open the second exhibit now and going to close the first one so it says that the sale is not going to get take place until the next year 24 25 and i would sell the shares for their full market value which is going to be for 7 470000 pound pole limited is an unquoted manufacturing company and i have never been an employee of pole limited and will not become one in the future right so he has very explicitly said that he is neither an employee nor is going to become uh, an employee of this company in future and then the acquisition from his aunt uh, acquisitions from his aunt are mentioned first of all on 1st may 2015 uh his aunt purchased 6000 odd shares for 295000 pound and then on 1st october 21 um his aunt gave all of her shares to him at the time they had a market value of 420000 and aunt and i made a joint election for the purpose of gift relief and this resulted in a gain of 112500 pound to be held over and for the sake of inheritance tax i was advised and you subsequently confirmed that the gift qualified for 100% rate of business property relief at that time because my aunt had owned the shares for more than 2 years but 12% of the value of pole limited total assets consisted of accepted assets i mean those which were not being used for business purposes and in the tax year 21 22 my aunt also made a gift of an investment property my sister and this occurred on 1st september 21 when the property had a market value of 360000 pound right so let's first open the word processing document and um, here i'm going to mention clearly that right now i am doing part c and this is the main heading is about sale of shares in pole limited okay here i would like to have an input from your side as well now in very brief words i would want you people to tell me that what has to be the inheritance tax implication considering no calculation has to be carried out as of now so only one student has answered that there is said to be no lifetime ihd ihd is payable on the death of her aunt so yes we are going to discuss the implication uh with respect to inheritance tax liability first thing which has to be made clear right now as 
it's about inheritance tax liability first of all when i talk about at the time of the sale i mean at the time of transfer if according to the requirement if on 1st october 21 if these shares would have been transferred over their market value then there is like no immediate iht implication so what would we write that the sale will be at full market value such that there will be no immediate IHT implication, right? But what happens when her when his aunt dies? As per mentioned in the question, that if Jake would not own the shares at the time of his aunt's death, then business property relief will not have been available because the full value of the shares at the time of gift of 420,000 pound will be subject to IHT. But where Jake does own the shares at the time of his aunt's death, then 100% business property relief will be available. However, the relief has to be restricted as it is clearly mentioned that 12% of the value of Pole Limited share uh, assets are consisted of accepted assets. So only 88% of the full relief will be available. And considering in the same tax year, could you see that um, in the tax year 21-22, one gift has already been given already to Jake's sister on 1st September 21 and right after uh, a month, another gift was planned to be given. So if the sister has already got a gift, the annual exempt amount has already been used against this. So considering the annual exemption amount for the current year as well as for the previous year has already been used, which is why no annual exempt amount will be available against the gift being made by aunt to Jake, right? So I'm just going to write down these important points as well. Because if you just consider the question, it is said that whatsoever the shares he has got, he is planning to sell the shares for their full market value, right? So if in case before that his aunt dies, he would have sold the shares, then no business property relief will be available because he's not got any replacement asset because if someone would acquire the replacement asset even then uh, the business property relief could be available but in such cases where no such information is given then of course business property relief is not going to apply as a result of Jake's aunt's death so I'm just going to write down both the points if Jake will not own 
own the shares by the time his aunt dies then business property relief will not be available because he has sold the shares and above that he has sold that shares for the full value of the shares at the time of the gift that was also subject to IHT. So such that the full value of shares at the time of gift had been subject to IHT over four hundred and twenty thousand pound but if Jake does not sell the shares before his aunt's death. I mean, if he retained the shares before the death of his aunt, then BPR will be available against death IHT on lifetime transfer, business property relief at the rate of 100% will be available. The rate will remain the same, but considering 12% uh, of the assets of the company are being used for accepted activities, which is why only 88% of the relief will actually be availed. However, the relief is restricted by restricted because of the presence of accepted assets. So, BPR will just be of 88% of the value of the gift and now we have to write down the general points as well as in no annual exempt amount and no nrb will be made available against this uh, as, against this transfer because uh, the available figure of annual exemption for both the current year as well as the previous year and the nilred band has already been used against the chargeable transfer being made to his sister already So that would mean that how much of the gain is like going to be chargeable for IHT purposes. It is simply the value of the shares less business property relief. Uh, the leftover figure will be subject to IHT. And can you please tell me what is going to be the death IHT rate? Yes, you are right. It is going to be charged at the rate of 40%. And we will also have to tell as it is like a general discussion that if there is a gap of more than three years from the date of gift till the date of uh, Jake's death, that there is like said to be uh, another advantage to be made available in terms of taper relief. So if Jake's aunt wouldn't die till 
फर्स्ट अक्टूबर टू थाउजेंड एंड ट्वेंटी फोर और इन सिंपल वर्ड्स इफ जेक्स आंट वुडेंट डाई बिफोर फर्स्ट अक्टूबर ट्वेंटी फोर आई मीन विद इन थ्री ईयर्स फ्रॉम द डेट ऑफ गिफ्ट देन पेपर रिलीफ विल बी अवेलेबल एट द रेट ऑफ ट्वेंटी परसेंट विद रिस्पेक्ट टू ईच पासिंग ईयर or you can simply uh, type it as that the taper relief will be available and of course that more the gap in between the date of gift and date of death will be the higher will be the taper relief and it is like increased by 20% every year so is everything now clear with respect to this part c of the question though the part c is not yet complete but whatsoever the implication we were supposed to discuss with respect to uh, sale of shares in poll limited from inheritance tax purposes that is there in front of you is that all clear yes if any transaction is being caught under capital gains tax there is like said to be no immediate iht implication but see as the current is in between aunt and jake i mean from one individual to another this is like said to be a potentially exempt transfer so this is like somehow exempt from iht purposes but when it comes to capital gains tax then yes cgt liability shall definitely have to be charged okay so i am quickly taking you to the second uh, i mean to the second point within the same requirement here we have to calculate the chargeable gain resulting from the sale before the deduction of any available reliefs and explain whether or not the following reliefs will be available the business property relief and the rollover relief i am going to open this exhibit again so they have said that how much gain is like uh, going to be held over in the form of gift relief this is of 112500 pound this is what they have themselves told in the question and i'm going to open the spreadsheet now and here i'm going to mention the requirement number it is part c and it's about sale of shares in pole limited and here i'm going to discuss the chargeable gains tax implication now could you see that first of all when aunt transferred the shares to jake uh, i mean from one person to another person the asset was transferred what was the base cost of shares for the recipient of the shares for doni for the recipient which is in this case jake when in the past the shares were transferred to him by his aunt usually when there is said to be a transfer of asset in between two individuals it's usually the market value at the date of transfer that shall be taken as cost for the recipient of the asset for the doni of the asset so when jake's aunt transferred the shares to him what had been the market value at that time that was of 420000 pound so for recipient i mean for jake the market value at the time of acquiring the shares shall be treated as the base cost but do not forget that when they these both parties had made a transfer of shares there they had claimed uh to hold the gain over in the form of gift relief and when the gift relief is claimed what is like going to be its impact 
the gift relief figure is going to get deducted against the cost of the asset, right? So how much of the gain were how much of the gain was being deducted against the cost of asset? It was of 112500, right? So against the cost of this asset, 112500 being the gift relief figure is going to get deducted. And that's how the base cost of shares for Jake will be 307,500 pounds. And now, if they say that he is now going to sell the shares in until the tax year 24 25 for 470000 pound they want to know that what is like going to be uh, the chargeable gain so the likely chargeable gain will be it's like he is intended to make a disposal for 470000 pound while for himself the base cost of the shares will be is equal to I'm going to put a sign of minus and then clicking on the cell because uh, the cost is deductible so whichsoever the thing is going to get deducted is going to get uh, eliminated from a value it shall carry a sign of minus before it and that's how we'll be, be able to come to know what the chargeable gain on the disposal of these shares will be. So that's going to be of 162500, right? So this is like said to be the chargeable gain. And it looks more professional if the main calculation has to be shown first and then the workings are presented. So what would I do? Um, I'm just going to highlight this row. I'm going to cut it and I'm going to take it over here. So I'm just going to take it a little bit up. Control X, Control V. And see, the main calculation is now being shown on the top and it's working is being shown below. So that, that gives a more professional look. But if I would have left the whole situation in exactly the same way as what I was doing before, even then the examiner would have taken it in a positive manner. He would have given me the full credit for it. But it looks more professional if you show the main working first and then the relative workings are to be shown on the bottom. Is that clear? Is there anything else which you need to know? Do let me know by dropping your concern in the dialog box. Okay, so let's quickly move towards another sub requirement. Within the body of this question here, we have to explain as well whether or not the following reliefs would be available, the business asset disposal leave and rollover relief. And we have to explain the reliefs which would be available in respect of any IHT payable following the death of Jake's aunt. Do you remember when it comes to uh, BADR, I mean business asset disposal relief, um, there has to be at least a shareholding of 5% in the company. Plus the individual who is going to sell the shares should be an employee in the company as well and both the shareholding as well as the status of an employee must be held for at least two years prior to the date of disposal and it in the question it was clearly said that he is not an employee now uh, and jake is not having any future plans to become an employee of this company so this is like very much clear that business as a disposal relief is not going to be available now just tell me, will the rollover relief be available against the, the, the disposal of shares? Though in rollover relief, it's not just the business asset to be disposed of. There has to be another business asset to be purchased as well. So there should be a replacement of business asset with the business asset 
but there is a very important point which indicates that rollover relief is not going to be available in this case. And what is that point? Can you uh, identify that why? I, I have told you that rollover relief is not available, but why? Why the rollover relief is not available? Don't say that there is said to be no reinvestment of the asset. There is one big reason on the basis of which if uh, he's like going to make uh, a reinvestment as well, even then Jake would not be able to claim a rollover relief. And what is that point? Okay. Uh, the point is selling whole of the shareholding. No. Um, let me just uh, make you people remember that when you had gone through the concepts of rollover and holdover, there we did discuss the type of the assets on which rollover and holdover reliefs are available. And rollover and holdover relief is available for individuals over land, building, an immovable plant and machinery as well as goodwill. Though goodwill is not going to be a qualifying asset for rollover or holdover relief when it becomes when it comes to companies, but in case of individuals, at least along with land building, immovable plant and machinery, the goodwill is also counted as a business asset. But not the shares. Shares, if they are sold, they would never, never ever be eligible for either the rollover or holdover relief. There's one more statement that he did not hold shares at the death date. This may have an implication related to business property relief implication, but not with respect to uh, rollover relief. As he has got the shares and he is like planning to sell those shares, if he's like going to sell the shares and whether he is like going to make, uh, whether he's going to get any reinvestment asset or not, he shall not be liable. He shall not be having any rollover or holdover relief considering on the disposal of the shareholding, there is said to be no implication of uh, holdover or rollover relief. This is not related to shares. Though there are multiple reliefs which are available with respect to the disposal of shareholding as in when it comes to gift holdover relief when it comes to business asset disposal relief when it comes to investor relief so there are quite a lot of uh, reliefs which are relevant to the disposal of shares but not at least rollover and holdover relief now from IHT perspective we need to mention one thing that we need to explain the relief which could be available. We need to mention the relief which could be available in respect of any IHT payable following the death of Jake's aunt, considering his aunt has already transferred him the shares. So when she dies, is there any kind of relief available? Could he be available to make use of any relief as a result of his aunt? They are talking about the amount of IHT that is payable. Is there any sort of relief available with respect to? Uh, see, I'm going to repeat the statement. Ex we have to tell, explain the relief, the relaxation, which could be available in respect of any IHT payable following the death of Jake's aunt. Yes, though uh, taper relief is available, but now if I connect it with the activity of disposal of shares in Poll Limited, see what the main requirement was. Jake is going to sell the shares. If he's going to sell the shares, it's all about, at the point of sale, it's all about capital gains tax. But would he be able to make an adjustment of any IHT which is due as a result of his aunt's death? Because when he's going to sell the shares, the capital gains tax liability is going to be due. And when his aunt would die, he will be liable. He being a donor of the asset, he will be liable to pay death IHT on lifetime transfer as well at the rate of 40%. So technically, he will be bearing two taxes an IHT, a death IHT on lifetime transfer as a result of his aunt's death. And simultaneously, when he's going to sell the shares, 
he will be like uh, responsible to pay capital gains tax liability so the question is that will he be a uh, 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 will he be entitled to get any adjustment of IHT that is paid uh, as a result of his aunt's death, would he be able to make an adjustment of any tax that he has already paid in the name of IHT to get adjusted against capital gains tax liability? Would that reduce his CGT liability? So students keep this thing in mind. It's a very simple point and whenever it is tested, it is tested in a descriptive way usually. Yes, it's a kind of double taxation but for this the relief is available the relief is given the adjustment will be given against the chargeable gain in respect of any IHT payable as a result of uh, death of Jake's aunt so when Jake's aunt would die whatsoever the IHT liability will be paid by him that is going to get deducted against the chargeable gain so his capital gains figure is going to be reduced and as a result he's like going to be uh, is he's going to pay a lower amount of capital gains tax liability and that is available uh, if the gift holdover relief was already claimed uh, was already claimed in respect of this gift so that is an additional point can I ask you that how many of you are enrolled in my uh, session at WIFI as this game changer webinar is available to all so, okay. So, out of all, only one student is from my enrolled session. Let me try to show you this thing. Right, so there's another student as well. I'm just going to show you this topic. There could be a chance that considering it's a very simple topic, nobody had paid much attention to it. So this is basically the topic. IHT deduction against capital gains tax liability. So it is available on the sale of the asset by Doni. See, the aunt had transferred uh, the shares to Jake. So Jake was the Doni. And considering if the following situations are fulfilled at the time of acquisition of asset. Number one, the gift relief was claimed in respect of the receipt of asset, which was claimed, by the way, in our question. And IHT was paid in respect of receipt of the asset. As a result of Jake's aunt's death, Death IHT got due and considering these two conditions are being met. So when Jake would eventually be selling off the shares, he will have to uh, reduce his chargeable gain figure by the amount he has paid already in the form of inheritance tax liability so that his gain would get lowered down and eventually he'll be able uh, to reduce his capital gains tax liability. See whatsoever the tax he has paid paid in the form of IHT is going to get deducted from the chargeable gain figure and not from the amount of CGT itself. Right? So I'm just going to um, write these points down. So I'll make the heading the availability. Of reliefs. As the first point is about business as a disposal relief. Business asset disposal relief is not available as Jake is not an employee in Pole Limited, right? Second point was about rollover relief. Rollover relief 
is not available in respect of disposal of shares and when it comes to the relief that is being asked in respect of IHT payable then we would say any IHT paid as a result of aunt's death by Jake is deductible against chargeable gains because gift holdover relief had been claimed on the transfer. So as what you have indicated that there would be a sort of double taxation. So in order to minimize the impact of double taxation, at least the tax which has been paid in the name of inheritance tax would be at least reducing the capital gains tax liability. So though he will be paying CGT liability, but it is somehow going to be reduced. So again, in order to make it more presentable, I'll shift it to the bullet points. There is a question. Um, what is the tomorrow timing? Uh, it is going to start one hour later. The tomorrow timing will be 6 p.m. according to the local Pakistan standard time, uh, plus 5 GMT, obviously. So 6 to 9 is going to be the time. So you'll have to adjust the time according to your time zone. For your ease, today's timing, whatsoever the time at which our today's session got started, our tomorrow's session is going to start one hour later, right? Uh, the question is, inheritance tax is not paid yet, but payable. Uh, see, it is a generic discussion. They haven't said that IHT has already been paid or it is like uh, pending or what. If it is going to be due, if it has become due, whether it is paid or not, so it is going to get deducted against the chargeable gains, right? Please provide quiz answers. Uh, right now, I am just done with um, the first question, section A, which is of 50 marks. So I'll be transferring you the solution for this part only, right? So when I'll be done with the remaining uh, two questions related to section B, I'll definitely make a transfer of those scripts too. Is that okay? So just tell me one thing that if there is anything else which you find complicated while going through your advanced taxation syllabus, please let me know if I could be able to address to that particular thing. Okay, the quiz solution has not yet been uploaded. Let me just ask uh, my teacher assistant because he has to upload it. He'll definitely do it shortly because I've already told him to do so. So students, uh, the question is employment benefit questions will be direct, not as direct as you have seen in your taxation syllabus. They might ask you that this is the person, he might get any extra benefit. So you will have to uh, first calculate the benefit, then you, ha you will have to tell that what additional tax is going to be due, then what NIC is going to be due by employer. So yes, uh, direct implication as well as all the related type of taxes can be asked in your advanced taxation examination. And students, I would like to bring your attention towards one more thing that in your um, portal, because this is the same portal which you expect to see in your exams. Here, on the left bottom side you can see a tab with the name help slash tax tables so i'm just going to open it up for you see 
you will be able to see the tax tables over here. There is a second tab for it. So there you can find uh, the tax slabs, the personal allowance figure. I mean, few normal rates and concepts which are provided in your exam would be found through this tab, right? Here you can also find out uh, uh, the national insurance contribution slabs, their percentages and all. Okay, so had you found uh, the session fruitful? Did you become able to grasp any knowledge? So the last part was found confusing a bit related to inheritance tax payable implication. Is that so? Okay. Actually, these are very simple, small concepts which are rarely tested. But see, for instance, if you uh, do not write that implication in your exam, um, at most, the marks you will be losing, like, from one to two marks, right? So the thing is, it is not at an expense of the thing. I mean, still there is like an ample time. You may go through all the things, but real impacts because uh, if if they are tested, though they are tested rarely, but if they are tested, they will be carrying from minimum one mark to maximum two marks. So that's not going to be much. But I hope whatever the part you have learned right now will be will remain there in your minds. You are not going to forget it in future. So I'm going to wind up uh, the session. Thank you so very much for being a part of this session. We'll see you all again tomorrow. Till then, goodbye.